so I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, and when I was looking at my briefing sheet and I saw that the uh, title of uh, this series is A View from the Top, I thought, well, I guess I've been on the top of an organization before, so I can give some insights on that. Um, but I thought what would be interesting is I've also sort of been trampled and on the ground with people's feet on my head uh, <laughs> looking up. Um, so maybe I could give a little perspective from that vantage point as well. Um, you do not want to hear me give a big, long speech, and I am not going to do that. I'm going to um, uh, reserve most of the time for, for a Q&A. Um, but in thinking about leadership, um, I, I was sort of reflecting, and I thought, OK, what, what would I want to share with young people uh, who are in uh, undergrad or graduate school today? Um, and there are three things through my experiences in DC and now with Students First that I think could be helpful, not in telling you specifically what you should do or not do, uh, but just to give you a sense of perspective. Um, so three things, very simple. The first. Uh, this is actually, this is a lesson that I learned um, when I was the chancellor, and it was one that came to me from a, a mentor and hero of mine, Joel Klein. So Joel is, used to be the, um, the chancellor of the New York City school system. And um, long before I was working in DC, um, the mayor of DC and the council members were trying to figure out whether they wanted to move to a mayoral control model or not. So they took a trip to New York. They met with Joel Klein and Mike Bloomberg. They toured the schools. They sort of saw what was going on there. And at the end of that visit, uh, uh, Adrian Fenty said to Joel Klein, OK, I want somebody like you to come and run the schools uh, in DC. Can you give me uh, a recommendation? And Joel actually ended up recommending me for the job. And because of that, he always felt this incredible sense of guilt. Uh, and so he would call me and kind of, you know, check up on me all the time. So I remember um, one evening um, in the height of sort of my first hundred days when things were really uh, getting a little tough, um, I was driving home one night. It's raining outside. It's like 11 o'clock at night, and my phone rings. And I look at it, and I see that it's from Joel Klein. So I pull over to the side of the road, answer the phone, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, um, how you doing, Michelle? I said, I'm, I'm doing OK. It's a little tough right now, you know, but I'm hanging in there. He's like, he's like that's good. He said, I, I am calling to give you some advice. And I said, OK, I am ready. And he said, oh, there are two things that I want to communicate to you tonight. I said, OK, I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. He said, the first one, he said, do you have a boyfriend? And I said, um, no, because at the time I did not. And he said, OK, so my first piece of advice is go out and get one. <laughs> and I said, um, OK, I did not think that I would be ever getting love life advice from Joel Klein. Uh, so I sort of hesitatingly you know, said, OK, sir. And he said, uh, he's like, here's what you need to understand. He said, this job is one of the loneliest jobs you could possibly have. He said, every day is just an absolute grind. He said, I would never be able to do what I do every day if I didn't have my wife at home. Because at the end of every tough day, I get into bed and she goes, baby, don't worry about it. She's like, you're not the crazy ones. They're the crazy ones. You are OK. He said, if I didn't have that grounding me every day, I would not be able to wake up every morning and go to work. He said, so my first piece of advice is go and find a boyfriend. I said, OK. I actually, meanwhile, did do that, and ha happily. Uh, so I listened to that piece. And then the second thing he said, he sort of got really quiet and serious, and he said, so here's my second thing. He said, you have to lead from the front. And he said it with such conviction and confidence that I said, OK, I got it. And I hung up the phone, and I pulled back onto the road, and I'm thinking, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> right? But I, I didn't want to ask him any questions, because I didn't want to see, oh my god, I was stupid. So you know, I'd get back on the road. And it actually wasn't until several months later that I had sort of lived through a lot of the turmoil of, of, the, of being the chancellor that I actually realized 
what he meant, right? Because when you are a leader, sometimes you've got to be out in front. You can see things that, that other people can't see at the time. And if you get mired in the, the muck, if you sort of get you know, pulled into every single argument on one side or another, you're actually not going to be able to move your organization as far as you can, as fast as you can. So when he gave me that piece of advice, I was actually in the middle of our school closure process, which was incredibly painful. You know, we had 144 schools. We were closing 23 of them. It was 15% of the schools. Uh, and if you ever want to quickly become the most unpopular person in a city, all you have to do is tell somebody that you're closing a school, much less 23 schools. So I was in the middle of this. And it was, it was just a tremendous amount of opposition and pushback. And the interesting thing was, about a year after we closed the schools and we went through that process, I was in one of the schools that had been consolidated. And uh, I was trying to check out you know, what the situation was. A woman came up to me. She said, hey, 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 look at me. You recognize me? She said, I was the one last year that was always screaming at you about closing the schools. I said, oh, yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> I could never forget that face. She's like, you know what? I just wanted to let you know you were right. She said, I didn't, I didn't, we couldn't see it at the time because it was such an emotional and sentimental process for us. And we were just angry at you and, you know, this whole process. She's like, but now I get it because we're in this school and the school has a lot more resources. Our kids are getting a better education, so I'm good. And she walks away. <laughs> and I'm thinking, where's the Washington Post when this kind of stuff happens, right? <laughs> but what I realize is this, we were... We were able to, because we made that incredibly tough decision to close those schools, we were able to create a new reality for the children in Washington, D.C. Because of that decision, we were able to provide an art, music, uh, an art teacher, a music teacher, a PE teacher, a librarian, a nurse, and a social worker or a guidance counselor at every single school in the city. For the first time in the history that anybody could ever remember, we equalized the resources so that having an art teacher wasn't dependent on whether you, you know, were at one of the schools that had wealthier parents and they could hold an auction to hire the teacher, et cetera. We equalized the playing field for all of the kids as it pertained to the kinds of curriculum that they should have. And had we got caught up in all of the sort of emotion and, and the sort of opposition and whatnot, we would not have been able to follow through on that decision, and we could not have provided the kids with those additional resources. So that's my first message is sometimes you got to lead from the front. My second observation, <clears throat> and, and you, could, you should either take my advice or not on this one, um, but I believe very strongly that in order to be an effective leader, you have to be okay with not being liked. And I'm like really, really good at this one. So you can, <laughs> you can, you can, you can take my advice. I, I remember very clearly um, about halfway through my second year as chancellor, uh, a columnist for the Washington Post wrote a piece. And it was sort of, you know, I like Michelle Rhee. She is doing, you know, good things and making hard decisions. I just wish she would be a little nicer. So I read the piece, and I'm pissed off. So I call the guy. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, no, you don't understand. He's like, I, I want you to be here for the long haul. I think you are good for the system. He said, but in order for you to be here, people got to like you a little bit more. You could be a little friendlier and nicer. And I, looked, and I you know, sort of said to him, I said, look, you have to figure out what you think the most important characteristics of a school's chancellor are. Uh, and quite frankly, if it's sort of personality driven, then, you know, and you want warm and fuzzy, then I am not your girl. And you should actually be advocating for my ouster. But if you like what is going on in the schools, if you believe sincerely that the right decisions are being made in the interests of kids, then you should not be saying Michelle Rhee needs to change her personality. You should be advocating that we kind of leave the personalities aside and focus on the policies of what's actually happening in the schools. So I say this because, you know, when I was in my first year uh, as a chancellor, my mother came to town. So when your mom comes to town, you get a whole different perspective on things. So my mom happened to come uh, at a time where uh, people were very, very angry at me. Uh, and so she comes into town. It was around the school closure stuff. 
and she, you know, opens up the Washington Post. There's a two-page spread on, you know, all the different schools that I'm closing, like pinpointed all over the city. She turns on the TV. There are people, like, you know, throwing things at me at a meeting and that sort of thing. Uh, she, she uh, over the weekend said there, you know, there are some really loud people down the block who are picketing about something. And I said, yeah they're picketing me. She was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is going on. So anyways, one night uh, at the end of uh, a long night of community meetings that I was having, I come home, I'm in the kitchen, I'm making myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My mother sort of creeps into the kitchen and she says, are you okay? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm good. And she looks at me and she goes, you know, when you were little, you never used to care what people thought about you. She's like, so I always thought that you were going to grow up to be really antisocial, but I see now that this is serving you well. <laughs> and I said, yes, um, it was. Because the bottom line is that if you are concerned in too strong a way with being liked, with whether or not you're popular, with what your polling numbers look like, et cetera, um, then you're going to make a different set of decisions. Um, and the bottom line is that no really significant change comes without some pretty significant pushback and opposition as well. And at the end of the day, if the decisions that you're making are the ones that you believe are right and you, 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 you have the confidence uh, of that, then you have to be okay getting that opposition, getting the criticism, and at the end of the day, not being liked so much. Um, so that's my second piece of advice. My third is actually about um, my boss uh, at the time when I was in D.C., Adrian Fenty, um, who was the mayor of D.C. He was the person that I reported to. And in my opinion, he is the person without whom none of what we did in D.C. could have happened. He was an extraordinarily uh, unique politician in that when he hired me, he said, all I want you to do is make the schools better. Make the schools a place where we want to send our own children every day. In terms of politics and the pushback, and whatever, I'll handle that, but we're not going to worry about it because at the end of the day, we're going to make every decision within what we believe is in the best interest of kids. He said that on day one to me, and of all the crazy things that happened to me in DC, actually none of that was particularly surprising. The one thing that I would say was surprising to me is the fact that that man never wavered one time. In fact, uh, this is a quick story. His primary election um, was in September uh, of 2010. And in August, we had just implemented a new teacher evaluation system where for the first time we were evaluating teachers based in part on whether or not their student achievement uh, levels had grown in the school. And so we had identified a couple of hundred people um, who, were, who were categorized as ineffective. And based on the, the framework and the structure that we had set out, we said that those people who had been rated as ineffective after their first year were subject to termination. But this is weeks away from his primary election. So I call the man and I say, okay, Mayor, so here's where we are. I reminded him about the new evaluation system. I said, you know, the decision is whether we actually, you know, move forward uh, with these terminations or not, because at the end of the day, I am very sensitive to the fact that you've got a race coming up. Um, I don't want to do anything to jeopardize your ability to, to um, you know, run the city effectively, et cetera. And he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if we take this action, will that ensure that kids in DC have better teachers in come fall? And I said, yes. And he said, then we got to do it. I said, really? He said, absolutely. Because every other political calculus that we make, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, right? So if we don't make this decision, does that mean I'm going to win the election? Can't, we can't tell. And that's not really, at the end of the day, what matters. It's not why we're here. We're here to make sure that the kids are getting a great education. And if you can tell me that by removing these people and bringing in other ones, that kids are going to get a, a good education, then I'm OK with that. So it was exactly the answer that I wanted to hear. It was not so much the answer that other people wanted to hear. So we made the decision. And you know the city goes nuts, right? And I started getting calls from people all throughout the city, people who were supporters of the mayor and mine, saying, are you insane? This is political suicide. You can't fire a bunch of people weeks before the election. And it was 
amazing to me how despite the fact that he was being told that his political career was potentially going to end with this decision, the ease and the confidence with which he made it because he knew that at the end of the day, it was the right policy decision to make. I wish I could say the same for politicians across this country and elected officials across this country. We live in a state where there is, to say a lack of political courage is an understatement. We live in a state where uh, not too many months ago, when it was found that in an LAUSD in Los Angeles, there was a teacher who had been a sexual predator and kind of molesting kids, et cetera, uh, a state assemblyman from LA introduced a piece of legislation. And all it would have done is made it easier for school districts to fire people who were sexual predators. It's a pretty low bar, in my opinion. That bill didn't even make it out of committee. Couldn't even go to the floor of the legislature for a vote because the status quo people and you know, folks who wanted to defend you know, the adult interests, et cetera, said to the politicians, don't vote for this, et cetera, et cetera. Couldn't even get a bill like that out of committee. A couple of weeks ago, we had a similar situation where a legislator uh, introduced a bill around teacher evaluation in the state. It was a very, very low-key bill. It just said three things. One, that parents and the community should have input into the evaluation. Two, that we should evaluate teachers and put them into four different performance bands as opposed to just satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And that for veteran teachers, we would move the time frame. So instead of uh, uh, evaluating them once every five years, we could evaluate them once every three years. The committee vote of nine committee members, six of them abstained. Abstained, which is to me, I, I was like, look, if you don't like the bill for whatever reason, then vote against it. But what is, what's the abstaining all about? So our, our, we had a bunch of Students First um, members at the, at the Capitol, and they were asking one of the people who had abstained, well, you know, wh why don't you take a stance on this? I mean, what do you believe about it, whether it's right or wrong, and you agree with us or not, but you, you have to take a stand. And the guy said, um, well, here's the thing. I've heard from people, constituents in my community um, on both sides. And so no matter what happens, there's going to be one group of people that's unhappy. And so I don't want to be in the middle of that. But that's your job, right? Your job is to hear from both sides what the pros and cons of something like this, and then to make a decision that you believe is in the public interest, right? that is going to serve your constituents best. Whether or not people get angry at you, that can't play into the calculus. Hardly the profiles of courage that you would like to see from your elected officials. So at the end of the day, um, my, my third point, and, and potentially one of the most important, is you have to, as a leader, have the courage of your convictions. You have to know what it is that you believe is right, and then you have to be willing to stake everything, essentially, on it. Whether it's your job, whether you're staying in office, so many of these politicians are like, well, here's the thing. If I take this vote, then these people are not going to like me. These people won't vote for me next time, and the world is a better place if I remain in office. And what I would argue is the world is only a better place if you're in office, if you're actually making the decisions that you think are right for your constituents. If not, and you're just you know, trying to determine which way the political winds are blowing, that's actually not moving us forward in the right direction. So having the courage of your convictions is my third. Um, but at the end of the day, here's what I believe in. Um, take questions, uh, and you can ask me anything you want. Um, here's why I feel these three lessons as it pertains to this incredibly important field of education is so important. Because public education is supposed to be the great equalizer in this country. It is supposed to be the thing that ensures that it doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor. We have a public education system so that every single kid can have an equal shot in life, right? You work hard, you do the right thing, you can live the American dream. Unfortunately, that is not the reality for, the, for a huge percentage of kids in our country today. In fact, 
in America today, America is towards the bottom internationally on social mobility, which means that if you are a child who was born into poverty in this country, the likelihood that you will ever escape poverty is slim to none. Why? Because if you live in a poor community with not a lot of resources, the likelihood is very high that you attend a failing school and that you will not gain the skills and knowledge that you need to be able to go on to higher education, get a high paying job, et cetera. So we are essentially saying to poor kids now, you don't have a shot in life because of the circumstance of your birth. That, in my opinion, is the most terrifying dynamic that we have going on in this country today. It goes against every single ideal that we stand for as a nation. We are supposed to be the land of equal opportunity where anybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. If you have the, the, the wherewithal, the, 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 the will, right, you can do this. But if we are ensuring that essentially we are keeping poor kids trapped in failing schools where they're not getting the education they deserve and then they can't live that life, what does that say about us as a nation? I would argue that it is everything that we don't want to say. It goes, it, again, it goes against everything that we stand for. And that is why if we are to focus on one issue in a, in, in a collective and bipartisan way in this country, it has to be this topic. Every single person in this room plays a role in this. Unless you stand up for kids, then we can't expect that anything, anything is ever gonna change. Okay, that is the end of my remarks, and then I will take questions. Okay, I think we have two people with mics, so I'll just go back and forth. Over there is the first. So thank you for coming. My name is Jamal. I'm a second year MBA student. I want to challenge you a little bit on the, the notion, the, the idea of being friendly versus being tough. Um, we spend a lot of time here studying the interpersonal intricacies of making tough decisions. And something I've come to learn is that there is a lot of middle ground sometimes. And I wonder, when you reflect upon your time in DC, do you ever think that had you moderated your personality, your toughness, you might have been more effective. I mean, for example, you've, you fired principals on TV, and I know you've, you've said you regret that in hindsight, but if that's indicative of kind of your general disposition, do you feel like you ever did a disservice to students by being tough to a fault? So here's what, what I said is um, you, 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 you have to be okay with not being liked. I didn't say you gotta be an a-hole, right? <laughs> Um, and, here's, and, and there's a difference between those two things. So I would go out all the time, out into the community, um, and, and you know, one of the things that I would often do is sort of you know, speak to large crowds of folks, or I would do living room meetings where you know, a constituent could invite me in to meet with you know, 12 or 15 of their neighbors. And oftentimes, after those kinds of meetings, people would say, wow, you're nothing like we thought you were gonna be like. You're actually kind of funny and charming. You know? So I could win people over. Um, and I, you know, I tried to do plenty of that. But at the end of the day, the question is, what, is more import what was more important to me, being liked and being popular or doing the right thing for kids? And I remember, I don't know if any of you saw the movie Waiting for Superman, um, but there's a scene in that movie where I'm in, a, I'm in a community meeting where people are like going nuts. And I, apparently I have this look on my face that's sort of serene looking. So, People ask me all the time, like, what were you thinking? Because, you know, people are yelling at you and calling you every name in the book, and, like, you look so calm. So I was trying to literally think back to, like, what was my mindset, right? And at the end of the day, I actually know what was going through my head, which was we are living in a city where 8% of the 8th graders are operating on grade level in mathematics. 8%. 92% of our kids do not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. And we have to do something radical to change that. You may not like it. You can scream at me all you want. But I am not going to let this continue on my watch. So I'm good with, you know, being, if you can go out there and, and, and win people over, absolutely you should try. But if that becomes your goal, Right? That becomes the outcome that you're seeking. That's what I think is problematic. So yes. um, thanks for coming to Stanford. 
the question I ask is, how do you take your values and translate them into school financing? And I'm thinking about, you're in Sacramento, uh, the state treasurer invests a ton of money through banks. Is there an opportunity for social impact bonds or some other financing mechanism that would have a little more uh, rationality, let's say, than the budgeting process in, in the capital? Because let's be clear, the current budgeting process is the least rational process around. Um, so he, here's, here's the, the bottom line. Uh, should we bring some, some reason and ration to how we spend money in schools? Absolutely, 100%. It is much more difficult than you think it would be for a number of reasons. First is what is widely sort of known and touted and talked about in this country. And in fact, if you go to any school district board meeting around this time, which is budgeting time, what you're going to hear anywhere across the country is what we need in order to fix the system is more money. But the, actually, the data doesn't bear that out, right? The data shows that over the last two to three decades in this country, we have more than doubled and almost tripled the amount of money that we're spending per kid in public education. That's controlling for inflation. And yet the results have remained pretty much stagnant. We, we are spending um, uh, more money per kid than almost any other OECD nation out there. Um, and yet, again, the results are not where we would want them to be. Uh, I can tell you from having led a school system where we were spending more money per kid than any, almost any other jurisdiction in the entire nation that people still were saying, we need more money, we need more money. And when I looked at the budget, we, were spe we had a $1 billion budget when I got to DC. And of that, 403 million of it was going into the classroom in the schools. That means the majority was being sucked up by this bureaucratic, bloated bureaucracy. We had no idea, there's no accountability, et cetera. And so when you talk to people in California today, you'll hear some similar things. Like if you go out any, to any school or any superintendent and ask them, how much money do we spend in California per kid? you will get an answer of somewhere between $5,500 and $6,500. That's what people will tell you. Actually, that is not correct. In this state, we are spending about $9,500 per kid per year on education. Those people are actually not wrong because there's a whole lot of money that they never see in the schools because it gets lopped off the top and put towards our unfunded pension liabilities, et cetera. In fact, Unfunded pension liabilities are a huge problem across the country. There's just a, 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 a piece of research that showed that just funding unfunded pension liabilities in a place like Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia right now, is costing that district between two and $3,000 per kid per year. We gotta fix that problem, because until we fix that, we can't say there's not enough money. It's just the, where the money is going. So what we believe in is advocating for transparency as it pertains to the, to the dollars. Now this is an interesting one because I was just in Ohio the other day and we were advocating for transparency of dollars and what we found was that there was a school district in the state of Ohio that was spending more money per kid on their cheerleading program than on their literacy programs. I kid you not. And I thought this is actually a good data point because I can't tell you that in that community those people wouldn't say yes, cheerleading is so important. I grew up in Ohio so I know people like their cheerleading. Um, the community might have said, yes, we, we value cheerleading more highly than literacy, in which case then, okay, so be it. But I would bet that there would be a whole lot of people who'd say, wait a second, this is crazy, and we got to change that. But until you have the data to show where the dollars are going and what kind of return on, on investment you're getting for those dollars, it's going to be very difficult to advocate for the changes that we need, and it's, I think it's always going to devolve down into, let's just, need, you know, let's just ask for more money. I'm not against more money, let me be clear. I'm just saying that you, you have to use the dollars that you have right now well before in, increased dollars are gonna have a, a significant return on investment. Hi, thanks so much for being here with us. Um, <clears throat> I had a question on, um, there, are, there are many areas uh, in ad reform, um, many different angles uh, that you could, you could attack uh, the issue with, and I'm wondering where, where are you seeing the most uh, like where, where are you most excited about it? Is it like federal, federal level, state level, district level, or is it uh, charters or other kind of groups like your own um, that you're currently leading? Thanks. So um, 
I would say this. One of the, the challenges that we face in education reform is that everybody is looking for the silver bullet solution, right? So I, I, on a monthly basis, I'll get calls from governors across the country saying, OK, Michelle, I'm going to take education on. Tell me the one thing that I should do. And usually, I refuse to answer that question. Because I say, there is no one thing that you can do that is going to change education in your state. It is much too simplistic a, a mindset to go in uh, to this with. So take Students First, for example, my, my new organization. We focus on three areas. We don't th think they're the only three areas. They're just the ones that we focus on. It's um, principal and teacher equality. We focus on empowering parents with information and choices. And we focus on fiscal uh, accountability and responsibility. Within those three areas, there are 37 different policies on our agenda. And our belief is that you have to have all 37 in place in order to create the kind of environment that's going to be ripe for real reform to take place. But what people want to do is just choose one. So somebody <laughs> will say, well, I'm going to pass the parent trigger, or I believe in vouchers. And then they believe that you, know, you implement a voucher program, and then all of a sudden everything's going to change because the market is going to rule. It just doesn't work that way. So part of, I think, what we have to focus on is understanding that how the, the, the system became the way that it is was very sort of a complex mix of issues all sort of coming together. And how we're going to solve this problem is also a complex mix of lots of different things happening. It's not just about one issue or one policy. Yes. Hi, I'm Jenny. Thanks for being here. Um, I appreciate your talking about leading from the front and being willing to take risks to um, not always be popular. Um, another part of leadership that I am trying to think about is how do you make sure that you're as inclusive as you can be and really build a cohesive movement. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how you think about balancing those two th things um, and whether there's maybe been a time in your leadership where you've decided to slow down or back off from one of your goals in order to bring more people along with you. Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and, and something that, to tell you the truth, we weren't able to do particularly effectively in DC. So, but this is the lesson that I learned from that. When, we, when I was in DC and we were implementing all of these incredibly aggressive reforms, we were out in the community a ton. I mean, I, every single night we held chancellors, policy forums, I had office hours, I was doing living room visits, I did um, you know, teacher talks twice a week. I mean, we were out there trying to engage the community in, what, in, in our reform efforts, getting their feedback, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, it didn't work. We were not able to create an environment where people felt that they were part of what we were creating. And so it's interesting because people say to me, well, this is, that shows that you, know, you can't bring people along. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. What it shows is that I wasn't successful at it. But just because I couldn't do something, I would never say that, therefore, it can't be done. right? So what I would hope is that the next superintendent who comes along, whether it's in DC or somewhere else, would be able to look at what we did, the things that we did well and the things that we didn't do particularly well, and then learn from those things and build off of them to try to chart a new course. Like That's what I think the most important thing was. So striking that balance I do think is important. And it was unfortunately something that we were never able to like do exactly the way that we wanted to do. I think that had we been able to stay for another term for four more years, I do believe strongly that that dynamic would have changed. Um, because for us, because what we were doing was so dramatic and we were doing it in such short order, we were getting that kind of immediate you know, opposition and, and pushback that, that often you do when you have significant change. What we weren't able to stay there for was people realizing, wait, OK, it's not so bad. Like, Yes, we have a new teacher evaluation system, but now I'm getting paid a whole lot more money because I'm effective in the classroom. You know, The sky didn't fall, et cetera. So, you know, but those things have to be in place for some time before people can come around to it. Um, and I think that's just a virtue of, you know, also sort of leadership and knowing that, that um, consistency is important too. And I think one of the most fortunate things about my experience in DC is that the woman who was my deputy was able to continue on, and she is now the chancellor in DC. So there was a tremendous amount of consistency within the policies that we were pushing, but the dynamics are different. And I think that she's, she's, she's doing a great job of that now. 
Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a first year MBA. Um, so I wanted to ask you about uh, some of the erasure scandals that have been happening nationally. Over the last few years, as you know, as there's been increased accountability linked with high stakes testing, um, that's also kind of been tied with teacher cheating, administrative teaching in New York, DC, Texas, and across the country. I'm wondering as a leader how you kind of where within this cycle you see the root cause beyond simply blaming the individuals involved. Yeah, so um, I'd say this. The, I believe very strongly that the vast majority of educators in this country would never, ever compromise their personal or professional integrity and cheat on a test because they know that that's cheating kids and they would never do that. Does that mean that there aren't a small number of people out there who are going to make the wrong decision? No, you're always going to have that circumstance. And I think that because of that, you need to be very clear with folks about the fact that cheating is unacceptable. You have to have very strong test security measures in place. And then when it does happen and you find that it happens, then you have to have consequences for those folks. So that's, that's generally what I feel. I think that the where this debate is going and where the conversation is going around the cheating stuff is just weird to me. Because what you're hearing a lot is, well, because there's cheating, this shows that we should not have high stakes tests because when you put these high stakes, you're making teachers cheat. That, that is so demeaning to the teachers across this country that I know. You're, you're implying that because you're putting, you know, because there's pressure that they're gonna do the wrong thing. There's pressure every day in a teacher's life. Forget. Forget tests for a moment. Because teachers know that the future of their kids, their students, rest in their hands. So they feel that pressure every single day. And they're not going to make crazy decisions in, you know, because, just because of they, they feel that pressure. So I, I feel like that's, that's part of the problem that's going on in the education debates these days. Is it is becoming sort of these very polarized extremes. That because you're seeing some of this happen, then we should get rid of standardized tests. No you should put the right security measures in place. Um, so that, I, I feel like the, at the end of the day, here's the thing. There are people out there who are sort of very anti-testing right now, and I actually understand exactly where these people are coming from. Because I, I can tell you as a parent, I have two kids. And um, last year when my younger daughter was in fourth grade, she started coming home in late April, and I, I'd say, well, where's your homework? And she'd say, I don't have any homework anymore. In fact, we're hardly going to school anymore. We're only going on field trips because the TCAP is over. That's the state test uh, where we live. And I, I thought, oh my gosh, this kid is saying this to me, right? If I was just a normal parent who didn't know anything about education reform, I would hate that test. I wouldn't, you didn't even have to tell me anything about it. I'd be like, why are we creating an environment where we're communicating either directly or indirectly to kids that after the test is over, learning stops, because that's somehow all important. So I get the, 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 the feelings of the sort of anti-testing, because when you have experiences like that, that makes you not want to like the test. At the other, on the other side of the equation, though, we have to have standardized, consistent ways of measuring whether or not children are learning, whether or not they're learning, they're able to do you know, what, what they should do for that grade level. So should we have, and, and standardized tests, though they are not perfect, are one way to do that. So do we need them? Yes. Should they be the end all be all, the thing that we all go to school around every, absolutely not. So what we need is a balance in the equation, just around with the cheating stuff, et cetera. You need, you need balance, you need reason, you need rationale when you are talking about the policies, because where people are on the extremes, it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Um, yes. Hi, Michelle. I'm Amber. I'm a second year MBA. I'm a graduate of DC Public Schools and a former TFA core member, Houston, 2008. I particularly like your idea of public education as the great equalizer. Um, one might argue, though, by virtue of us being here at Stanford, that we are the winners in that equation. So my question to you is, how do you get people involved in the public education debate and, I guess, the movement, particularly considering most people that leave here might not go into the education sector, or if we end up in banking, finance, consulting, what, it, what might have you. It's easier to say that's a very difficult problem to solve. I'm going to put my kids into public or private school and forget the issue. Yeah. So that's a great question and, and one that, that vexes me every day. Um, because take, take, for example, business folks, right? 
the vast majority of business people that I run into on a daily basis say to me, you know, Michelle, God bless you. You know, Godspeed, keep doing the work that you're doing. I mean, it's just amazing. And I say, great, do you think you could sit on my board or help me? And oh, no, right? <laughs> um, so, and, and, and literally, if I had a dollar for every person who told me this, like, students first would be set for a long time. And it's, and it's frustrating, but at the same time, it's understandable, right? If you have a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who takes a stand on education, and then the unions or whoever like come after, why are you supporting students first? Why are you taking a stand on this issue? Let's boycott the company, their stock prices go. Then they're not actually fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities to their organization. So while they may think that education is important, it's not worth it for them to take it on because they have other stuff to worry about day to day, right? So that, I think, makes a whole lot of sense to me and you can't begrudge people for that. But that said, <coughs> I think that part of the, the, the dynamic that we need to create is getting people, not just business people, parents who have their, whether they have their kids in public school or not, to understand that this is an issue that is going to impact all of us in the long run, right? Because how you get people involved in a movement, typically, is if it impacts their day-to-day -day life, right? I mean, people are busy every day come out to a meeting, come to the Capitol, write a letter. Oh, I have 52 million things to do. Like, I can't fit that in. Unless you say, your kid is not going to be able to go to this school. Then I will clear my calendar to make things happen. And part of what we haven't been able to do for the vast majority of Americans is show them how whether getting involved in public education in this fight or not is going to impact their livelihood, their day-to-day -day life. Right? It seems too far removed right now. And that's what we've got to kind of connect the dots on. Um, but I, just a quick thing, this is so for employers and business people, 50% of, um, of employers in a recent survey said they could not find people in their applicant, in their candidate pool, who had the skills and knowledge that they needed to fill mission critical jobs. In this economy, with this kind of an unemployment rate, you have people who have jobs and they're saying they can't find people to fill them. That is crazy. That means that we are not we don't have an education system that produces kids with the skills to fill the jobs that are available. And this disconnect is only going to widen as time goes on. So if we are creating a world in this country where you know, we might have the Facebooks and the Googles and whatever, but all the coders and the engineers, are, hey, half of them are being employed by people in, um, in India and China because that's, that's who has the skills, that is a huge problem for our country writ large. And so connecting those dots is one of the things that I think we have to do in order to crack this open and really get a broader swath of people involved in this effort. Oh. Oh, I'll go back first and then okay. you after that. Sorry. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Alan Enthoven and I'm a retired professor of public management in this school. And my question is to ask for some clarification in your thoughts about the unions. I read a lot about, uh, you know, excessive unfunded pension liabilities, about inability to, you know, fire sexual predators and all kinds of awful stuff like that uh, on the one hand. And then I have an argument with my daughter who's been in the Department of Public Instruction in uh, North Carolina, and I say the unions are the big problem. And uh, she says, well, we don't have teachers unions in North Carolina, and we still have those problems. Yeah. So help yeah. us understand your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, you know, I run into people every day who say, you know, the unions are the problem, and if we just, we didn't have the unions, everything would be better, and the unions are the root of all evil. I actually don't agree with that at all. Um, I believe that unions are doing exactly what they are supposed to be doing, right? The job of the union, the purpose of the union existing is to um, look out for the rights, privileges, and pay of their members, and they are doing a bang-up job of that. So you can't begrudge them the fact that they're doing exactly what they were created to do. You can't hate on that. I don't actually think that the unions doing their job is the problem. I think the problem is that we have, to date, not had an organized national interest group with the same heft as a teacher's union that's advocating on behalf of kids. Because if you had that, then you'd have balance in the equation, right? And then you'd have a powerful force that was out there saying to politicians, if you're going to vote for this, then you know, we'll support you, and if you don't. But in the absence of that 
counter force, you end up with a skewed landscape and a skewed environment towards the special interest groups. And it's not just the teachers union, it's testing um, companies, it's textbook manufacturers, you name it. There are a lot of adults' interests out there in education who are just doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the, the, the environment becomes skewed towards those special interests when you don't have a, a balance in the equation. So that is what I would say is the, is the problem that we need to be solving for, not how are we gonna change the unions, because like I said, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I will say this, that on some issues, I don't think the union is, is serving their members particularly well. And I'll take the pension issue as an example. If we don't do something to solve the pension problems, the systems are gonna go bankrupt, and people who are relying on this in the long run are gonna be screwed, and that is not good. If you actually look at polling of new teachers, right? So say you're gonna create a new pension system um, and you grandfather everybody who has more than five years experience in, right? You can keep your current benefits as they are. And you're just looking at people who have not yet invested in the program. The vast majority of those people actually, they don't, they're not interested, they, 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 wouldn't, they don't prefer a defined benefits program. They would prefer to have a portable, more flexible uh, pension system. Um, so if moving towards a more flexible system both solves the problem and is what more teachers prefer, new teachers prefer, then why wouldn't we move towards that, right? So the, that, that's the, the, the kind of circumstances where I think that, that unions need to sort of be moving along with us because it's gonna better serve their members and better serve sort of the general um, school district uh, operations because like I said, right now these pun funded pension liabilities, a huge percentage of the dollars that are being used to try to fill these holes are being taken out of the classroom. So that doesn't benefit their current members. Um, the, yes. Hi, my name is Chen. Um, so my expertise isn't in, isn't in education, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, my understanding is that socioeconomic level and parents' education level are probably the biggest determinants of uh, learning outcomes by a big margin, by a really wide margin. So I was wondering, based on your experiences, uh, I wonder how much of our problems with education today are due to broken policy and how much of it is because of um, deeper, more intractable social problems. Yeah. And I think because of uh, kind of DC's unique situation in terms of socioeconomic inequality and also learning outcomes, you're kind of uniquely positioned to speak to this. Yeah. So here's what I, I will say. When kids are living in abject poverty, does it make it harder for them to come to school ready to learn every day? Absolutely. Does it make it harder to teach them effectively? Yes, unequivocally. Those are two realities. But can we use poverty as an excuse for why kids aren't performing at high? No. I, I staunchly refuse to believe that because if you look at the research, it is very clear that of, of all of the in-school factors that exist, the teacher quality is the factor that has the most impact on student achievement levels. So if you look at a recent study that was done um, by Raj Chetty from Harvard, it showed that if a kid has just one highly effective teacher in their lifetime, in their 12-year schooling experience, that it increases their lifetime earnings, their likelihood of graduating from high school and going on to college, decreases the likelihood that they'll have a teenage pregnancy. Just one out of the 12 teachers that they have, just one increases those things. We know, based on the research, that if you have three highly effective teachers in a row, it can literally change a kid's life trajectory. Four in a row, and you can actually close the achievement gap. So that's not saying that poverty doesn't provide a, a, a huge obstacle and barrier and challenge to our children every day, but what it does say is that there are things that we can be doing within the schools every day that can make a significant difference in these kids' lives. And when I say these things, oftentimes people say, well, you're blaming the teachers, you're putting too much pressure. I'm not blaming the teachers for anything. These problems don't exist because teachers are doing what they are. What I'm saying is that if we look at the situation that we're in now and we look at the po potential solutions, I believe that teachers are the solution to the problems that we face. If we know that three or four highly effective teachers in a row can change a kid's life trajectory, why shouldn't we be aspiring as a nation to make sure that every single kid has a highly effective teacher in front of them every single day? That's not anti-teacher, that's just, that's just wanting to put every kid 
in, a, in an environment where they are most likely to be successful. And I, I, I think that that being controversial or whatever makes absolutely no sense to me. We have to know within every sector that we're in, but in particular in education, that what we do matters. And I would say this, if you look any, at any place in history, over any time period, any country or whatever, the most effective strategy that we know to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty is not a social program or what, it's making sure that kids are getting the education they deserve. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so there's a two-part question. The first, the first part is, um, what lessons can the US learn from some of the other education systems in the world? And the second question is on behalf of the View from the Top team. Um, we like to close with um, the question that we all get asked as we apply to the business school, which is, what matters most to you and why? That's a little heavy. Um, <laughs> so what lessons can we learn? I just finished reading a book um, that it hasn't come out yet, but it's going to be out shortly. Uh, that's called The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. And uh, it's a book written by a, an American uh, journalist who has been sort of in the, she wrote a big piece about me when I was uh, the chancellor and she got sort of inundated with all this, you know, well, why are you saying that Michelle Ray is doing X, Y, or Z? So she, she started hearing, you know, from people who were saying, well, we need to do what Finland is doing, we need to do what South Korea is doing. And so she decided to go to Finland, South Korea, and Poland to figure out what those systems are doing. Um, and I, the book is fascinating because it actually tells us a lot about what we should and shouldn't be doing. We should not be trying to replicate a situation like South Korea. Those people are crazy. Those are my people, so I can say this. <laughs> We're a little crazy. <laughs> Koreans have no moderation. We're like nuts and, you know, look, everything is focused on, like, nuts. Anyways, so we should not do that. Um, but we, sh we also can't, can't continue to sort of believe, you know what, if kids are poor, they face too many challenges, there's nothing that we can do to overcome the, po you know, the challenges of poverty and therefore we're going to throw our hands up. That's not the right answer either, right? And so what I think she sort of called out of the various countries that are doing quite well is that there is, um, number one, a, a very, very strong focus on teacher quality. Um, and a lot of these countries do this on the front end by not allowing anybody but the highest achieving people to actually become teachers and go into schools of education, right? And then holding them to a, to a high standard uh, throughout. So that's one piece. A, a, ver a, a curriculum uh, that is very, very sort of focused on having high standards for all kids um, is another piece to it. And then um, having accountability at all levels. So not just of teachers and of administrators, but of students too, to say, look, we're going to hold you accountable if you're not doing the right things. So I'd say those are some of the, the, the lessons that we can learn from, from other countries. And again, if we, if we do things in moderation, I think we can actually vastly improve where we are as a nation. Um, your second question was what? What matters what ma most to you and why? What matters most to you and why? I would say that what matters most to me is kids. I mean, this is what, this is what makes me get up in the morning. It makes me want to fight every day for what is in their best interest. Because um, so I, now that I run this political advocacy organization, um, I have a lot more interaction with our elected officials, which is unfortunate in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> I was not too long ago talking to one of them who said, you know, Michelle, I get it. You, you, your policies make you know, logical sense to me, and I'm not against them at all. He said, but what you need to understand is if I vote for this bill in the way that you want me to, you have to understand that I'm going to go back home, and then the, the teachers or whoever are going to be picketing in front of my office. And those are my constituents. And I have an obligation to serve them. And I said, you absolutely do. I said, but when you're talking about your constituents, you need to think about all of your constituents. And at the end of the day, you also have an obligation to serve the children of your district. And guess what? They don't vote, they don't contribute to campaigns, and they don't organize rallies on your office. So if you're just moving and turning towards where the voices are loudest, 
necessarily, that means you're going to be turning your backs to kids, your back on kids. And that is unacceptable. You have to be able to do this. And this is what I, I believe. I, I believe so strongly in what children are capable of doing. I did, when I, throughout my entire term as a chancellor in DC, I never made a substantial decision without talking to kids and engaging them in the policies. Because despite what all the adults were always saying and the arguments that we were having, the kids were the ones who had the most insightful, rational, reasonable conversations and debates. I kid you not. The kids were always like, yeah, but yeah. And then they'd you know, go back and forth with each other and be like, you're right, we're all right, but this is what. So they could actually do this in a way that, that, that adults couldn't. Um, the problem is we don't listen to them enough, in my opinion. Um, and in, in, the other thing that I believe very strongly is there is nothing that is more worth fighting for than the future of a young person. So kids, without a doubt, most important thing. Thank you.